Welcome to Africa Business Reports with me, Komla Dumo. Each month we'll be bringing you the stories and individuals driving business across Africa. This month we're in Johannesburg, South Africa, the economic powerhouse of the continent. Later on the program, we'll go to Kenya, where big technological changes mean more people are paying for goods and services with their mobile phones. We'll also be in Africa's most populous nation, I'm Mark Edo in Lagos, Nigeria, and I'll be reporting on what could become the biggest free trade zone in Africa. We'll hear from Zimbabwe's industry minister, who will tell us why he thinks his country's economy is on the mend. All that and more ahead on this edition of Africa Business Reports. But first... In spite of the economic downturn in many parts of the world, the construction industry in Africa is actually experiencing a bit of a boom. It's fueled in part by a growing African economic middle class. But in the case of South Africa, it's twofold. World Cup 2010 comes to this country next year, and it's really fueling a boom in the construction industry. And then there is also the government's massive investment in infrastructure, a real economic stimulus package. I've been investigating the boom in the construction industry and asking just how long is the party going to last? Johannesburg, like many major cities around Africa, is plagued by nightmarish traffic. It can take hours to crawl a few kilometers. That's not just frustrating for motorists, it's also bad for business. Moving goods and workers can become a logistical nightmare. So sorting out this mess is a major priority for the South African government. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our Arabics R21 site. It's good to be here. 30 kilometers from Johannesburg lies a huge road-building project designed to upgrade the crucial National Route 21, linking the city with the capital Pretoria. It's being carried out by the road-building giant Robex. It's uh, significantly enhancing the road infrastructure uh, link for between Pretoria and the airport. Historically, the project is worth $90 million and is a prime example of the race for infrastructure development in South Africa, fueled by the government's $70 billion stimulus package and the World Cup. It's meant healthy rises in profits for many construction companies and soaring share prices. But once the government cash is spent and the football fans have gone home, will the boom in infrastructure projects be over? No, uh, specifically on, on infrastructure spend, we, we do believe there's a couple of good years left. However, um, you know, it, it clearly can't grow at the pace that it has been growing. The stimulus is there, but it, it can't be an endless stimulus. Uh, we're not oblivious to that fact, and we've been quite proactive into shifting our boundaries and expanding our geographies into Africa. But that is for the long term. Uh, in, in the short term, you know, the World Cup acted as a, as a catalyst to, to get things rolling. But uh, the site we're standing on now is the first phase of three. So there's two further phases which will commence post the World Cup. So, uh, you know, the stimulus will continue. Away from the big infrastructure projects, some parts of the construction industry in South Africa are suffering. The country may have been spared the worst of the credit crunch, but lending to home buyers has slowed down. And that's hit the companies building homes. Their troubles, though, may only be temporary. I believe it's more cyclical slowdown there, rather than a structural collapse, simply because there is such a shortage of, 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 of housing in, the, uh, in, the, in this uh, country. And it's really across the board of all kinds of accommodation. Um, uh, but but it's, uh, in, in the lower end, there are still millions of people who live in, for instance, shanty towns um, that, that need uh, accommodation. And that, that probably is true across Africa. Um, and, and that you know that from a potential point of view that as the the banks start lending again um, you, you will find that that sector picks up quite smartly whether it's house building or bigger projects not everyone is convinced about the benefits of a resurgence construction sector and see how people you know live their lives on a day-to-day -day basis unions have staged strikes aimed at improving pay and conditions for workers they say people at the sharp end of the construction industry are getting left behind. Our workers are not benefiting from the 2010 World Cup. They have got nothing to show for it. They remain in their shacks. They remain poor. There is nothing to show out of this uh, uh, beautiful game that is coming to South Africa. What we have seen is that we have seen very beautiful annual reports belonging to the companies showing how much millions they have made and uh, how much millions have gone to the pockets of chief executive officers. And yet workers are earning 2,500 rand a month. 
uh, which is not even assisting them in terms of paying for petrol to travel to work. The unions accuse the companies of greed. The firms say without big profits, jobs will suffer. It's a perennial debate. As that debate continues, so too does work on National Routes 21. Robex, the builder, is confident it will be completed on time and on budget. The industry as a whole also seems confident that its fortunes, at least for the time being, will continue to rise. Now, for many African countries, attracting foreign investment has always been a challenge. And now it's become even more difficult with an economic downturn in Europe and the United States. So here's how some African countries have responded. They've set up what are known as free trade zones. These are places where multinationals can come in, set up shop, and in some cases, pay little or sometimes no tax at all. It really does beg the question, what's in it for the ordinary African? Mark Edo has been checking up on that in Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation. In Lagos, they hope this will be the road to economic success. The Lekki Free Trade Zone is being carved out of thousands of hectares of untamed land near the coast of Nigeria's commercial capital. The first part um, is 3,000 hectares. They call Shola Awuru the empress of the zone. This former city banker is in charge of creating what she believes will become the Dubai of West Africa. The idea is actually to create a new model city, not just industrial, also um, a residential commercial area so that you have a self-sustaining city. While Lagos State is providing the land, a Chinese consortium is responsible for the actual construction. And there's a lot to build. The zone will have its own international airport, deep seaport, and its own water, power, and sewage systems. The idea is to have the zone as a catalyst for economic development in Lagos State, diversify the economy. We would want to attract foreign direct investments into Lagos State. There are 23 other free trade zones in Nigeria, all vying for the attentions of international investors. But the Lekki Free Trade Zone here in Lagos has one big advantage, size. At 16,500 hectares, it could become the biggest in Africa, four times the size of Manhattan in New York. Foreign companies are promised 100% ownership of their investments, and they'll be free to bring their workers in and take their profits out. The zone will be tax-free. Sounds good for the companies, but is it good for the country? The governor of Lagos State, Babatunde Fashola, says yes. Every time we import goods, we invariably, without knowing it, export jobs. Because we keep those industries offshore, away from our, from, from our economy, busy. And we can win by that by keeping the jobs here on our land. There's a race to build free trade zones across the continent. One economist says it's because African countries realize they must open up their markets quickly. The truth is that the nation as a whole and the markets as a whole have come to accept that they must move in the direction of free trade. Because one, it opens up their markets, so investment flows come in. Two, it makes their domestic industries more competitive. That's the hope for the Lekki free trade. But back at the zone, Shola Awaru can't dwell on what might be. She's got a new model city to build. Marketo, Africa Business Report, Lagos, Nigeria. That ends part one of Africa Business Report. Stay tuned, there is much more to come in the program, including one man who's making the most. Welcome back to part two of Africa Business Report, coming to you this month from Johannesburg, South Africa, a nation that's caught up in World Cup fever. The world's biggest football tournament comes to this country next year, and it's estimated that at least $3 billion will be pumped into the nation's economy as a result. Now, obviously, that's good news for the big construction firms that are building stadia, like this one you can see right behind me. But what does it mean for the little guy? Mpol Lakaje has been finding out from one man who's caught up in World Cup fever. <laughs> It's lunchtime at Soccer City Stadium. The workers are filling up before another busy afternoon. 
they are preparing for next year's World Cup. That's chicken stew. This is a chicken stew, although it's about to finish now. My food is fine, man. We've got a, a cow head. Mm. It's so nice, bro. This is a, a beef stew. Everybody knows the beef, beef stew. Uh, the food is nice. For me. It's better. And then this is a pub. This is an inti one of the indigenous food for the African people. Oh, this is only right. One hundred fifty. Okay. Uh, two rands. Mshele Machola has been a food vendor for three years. He is running what has become a famous restaurant. All right, all right. Okay. This is what's on the menu today. This meal goes for nearly three US dollars. It seems quite reasonable for the workers here because Mshele says on a good day he sells to dozens of people, creating job opportunities for four other family members. Mshele is not the only one benefiting from the World Cup build-up. Some have traveled from the countryside to make the most of this opportunity. To South Africa, it's twofold. World Cup 2010 comes to this country next year and it's really fueling a boom in the construction industry. And then there is also the government's massive investment in infrastructure, a real economic stimulus package. I've been investigating the boom in the construction industry and asking just how long is the party going to last? All that and more ahead on this edition of Africa Business Report. But first, in spite of the economic downturn in many parts of the world, the construction industry in Africa is actually experiencing a bit of a boom. It's fueled in part by a growing African economic middle class. But in the case, just mean more people are paying for goods and services with their mobile phones. We'll also be in Africa's most populous nation. I'm Mark Edo in Lagos, Nigeria, and I'll be reporting on what could become the biggest free trade zone in Africa. We'll hear from Zimbabwe's industry minister who will tell us why he thinks his country's economy is on the mend. Johannesburg, like many major cities around Africa, is plagued by nightmarish traffic. It can take hours to crawl a few kilometers. That's not just frustrating for motorists, it's also bad for business. Moving goods and workers can become a logistical nightmare. So sorting out this mess is a major priority for the South African government. Welcome to Africa Business Report with me, Komla Dumop. Each month we'll be bringing you the stories and individuals driving business across Africa. This month we're in Johannesburg, South Africa, the economic powerhouse of the continent. Later on the program, we'll go to Kenya, where big technological changes